Dr. Gerbold is distinguished professor of education at the Pennsylvania State University, teaching graduate seminars in theory and philosophy as they relate to contemporary issues in education. At the undergraduate level, she works in the elementary and early childhood program, teaching literacy methods course courses for pre-K through fourth grade pre-service teachers. She is the editor in chief of the Bank Street Occasional Paper Series, she is also a psychoanalytically oriented psychotherapist doing play therapy with children in a community mental health setting. Dr. Bolt, on behalf of the Center for the Study of Childhood Art, welcome to the Childhood Art Speaker Series. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. I've, I've known both Chris and Han for many years, actually starting when they were doctoral students. And I, I know I saw Tina Thompson is here and I know she probably feels the same. It's it's fantastic to see you being recognized in your your by the world for the 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 gifts and um and brilliance that your doctoral family always knew that you had. So it's lovely to see you in, in these positions and out in the world. Um, okay, I'm gonna take the screen um, and start sharing my PowerPoint. Oops, wrong view. Okay. So there we go. All right. <clears throat> Just a sec. All right. Um, whoop, that's not working. There we go. In their 1996 chapter, Folk Psychology and Folk, Folk Pedagogy, David Olson and Jerome Bruner told us that how we teach is based on usually unexamined implicit assumptions about the nature of the learner's mind or more broadly about how learning happens. These assumptions are the everyday intuitive theories, which they call our folk pedagogy that underlines how we teach. Folk pedagogy shape, shape the expectations that teachers, parents, administrators, children, curriculum designers, politicians, the media, and really everyone has for what schools look like. They are, in other words, the largely enact, the, the enacted but largely unthought about culture of schooling. We need, say, say Olson and Bruner, an anthropology of pedagogy, or perhaps what Foucault might call a genealogy of the tacit theories of teaching and learning that shape our educational practices. I'm a literacy educator, and while I, I imagine that there's some aspects of the folk pedagogy, the tacit theories of teaching and learning that literacy people share in common with artists and art educators, I think there are probably many differences as well. What I want to talk with you about today is how becoming a child psychotherapist which happened late in my career, changed my mind about teaching. I feel quite clever about this title. I changed my mind because I mean by it both how my theory of learning changed and how it changed me, how I have a different mind than I did before I began doing therapy. And as I have been preparing for this talk, I've wondered how much of what has changed for me will not be news for you. Um, will actually be a good fit for your own folk theories. I hope I don't end up sounding too much like a new convert to a religion that you've long been part of. But that said, to whatever extent what I address is part of the folk pedagogy of art education, I think it can be helpful to hear how an outsider experiences the water you swim in, making visible things you may not often name for yourself. Yep. Why is that doing that? There we go. Across most of my 30 year career, first as a third and fourth grade teacher, and then as a university based literacy methods teacher educator and a literacy researcher, I assumed that education primarily occurs through the language of content or curriculum. I thought of teaching and learning primarily in terms of speech or text as ideas that could be represented or that seemed to matter, matter to literacy. Perhaps things like, what do you think the main character is feeling? Or, this is one of the strategies that writers use. Well, schooled in multiliteracies, of course, I understood language to include not only spoken and written language, but also multiple ways of making meaning and communicating meaning, including visual, audio, spatial, behavioral, just, and gestural forms of symbolic representation. This unquestioned faith in the efficacy of speech and consciously represented ideas was abruptly and dramatically changed when eight years ago, I began my practice as a psychotherapist, working through play therapy with children ages three to 12. Although I continue my work as a professor, this was a fulfillment of a long held wish to work clinically with children who had experienced significant trauma or loss. 
As a new therapist, although I worked through play therapy, I transferred my faith in the power of language onto my clinical practice. My folk theory, theory of therapy, heavily influenced by my own adult experiences as a patient in psychoanalysis and by my training in psychoanalytic psychotherapy, was that my clients and I would mostly work through language, which would be part of or imposed upon the play. I imagined, for example, that we might be playing with family dolls and the child would suddenly articulate the things that were bothering them. My grandma's sad and cries a lot and that makes me mad. Or my dad is in jail and I'm afraid. Or I imagine the children playing out scenarios where the symbolic meaning would be hidden just below the surface, where I can make an insightful comment like, gosh, those snakes remind me of your dad when he's angry. And that somehow this would lead to the, the child to a freeing insight or a feeling of being dramatically understood. I believe my task was to get the children to speak my ideas about their realities. I saw the purpose of the play as bringing forth implicit content about their daily lives. And I imagined that I would then help the children translate that contact, content into spoken language. And this would prompt the learning that would allow for positive change. And indeed, I certainly encounter play that can be rather easily understood as having symbolic content. A child who is taken from her parents and put in foster care who constantly wants to play hide and seek, or a child trapped in a nasty custody battle who plays at being kidnapped with much confusion about who the good and get bad guys are. But what turned out to be true was that talking about those things as representations of reality almost always caused the children to recoil. Regardless of the kind of care the children have received, regardless of neglect or abuse, my clients love their parents and work to protect them and their memories or, or fantasies of their life with them from any intrusion or commentary or criticism or judgment on my part. And so the children rarely talk about their lives, their circumstances, their families, or anything happening outside of the playroom. I can ask questions about their lives, but the questions are almost always perfunctorily answered something they have to respond to to get it out of the way, to satisfy me, and then to get back to their real agenda, which is the play. When the children come into my clinical space, they almost always entirely focus on playing. When they talk, their speech is predominantly focused on directing me in how to play or criticizing me for not playing correctly. And yet over time, and in spite of the fact that the children almost never say the kinds of things I imagine they would, change happens some of it on the part of the children and some of it on my part. We develop strong therapeutic relationships. I have been successful as a therapist, but I have struggled to understand why. It has been this lack of understanding how and why the therapy is effective that caused me to turn to research that provide me with a new way of thinking about learning and change. What I found prompted profound change, not only in my understanding of how therapy works, but also in my thinking about learning more broadly. In the remaining time, I'm going to describe some of those changes through describing two clinical experiences with two children. However, I want to make clear that to protect the privacy of my clients and their families, the clinical stories I tell herein are disguised composites of many children and many events. The two children I talk about here today do not represent any one of my clients. Names, age, and other details such as words, activities, using sessions, and details of their lives and experiences have been altered. Indeed, the stories are not about my clients so much as about processes and materials, specifically the role of sound and rhythm in learning and the role of materials, in this case of sand. These are things that I am imagining that you as art educators may already know something about, the efficacy of things that are not about symbolic meaning, but are about the experiences of doing. So now I'm going to start with the story of Lauren and the sound of the speed of sound. I'm sitting in the black chair in my playroom, there's my black chair over there, where I eat, meet each week with children for play therapy. I have turned my chair away from the center of the room as much as I'm able to in the cramped space I'm allotted in this under-resourced rural Medicaid clinic. You can sort of see out the window here is the rurality of the clinic. And I'm staring at a wall. I don't know much about, the, uh, I don't know how much of the 50 minute session with Lauren I will have to sit this way in response to her demand that I do not look at her, do not talk to her, do not do anything that calls attention to the fact that I exist or that I'm aware of her. This is a familiar move in her dance of fending me off, of refusing my attention or care, 
which feel intrusive and painful to her. Lauren, eight years old, has been in and out of foster care for years. Her parents are sporadically incarcerated. Lauren loves them and misses them, although their care for him, her were, was erratic and often damaging from my perspective. In her first session, in response to my talking to her, Lauren turns her back, covers her ear, ears, and sings loudly. She does this every time, making speech impossible. This persists for several weeks. She usually hides behind the play kitchen, humming and singing loudly anytime she hears a noise from me. I sit in my chair and draw pictures, which I hold in her direction in case she wants to look, but with no expectation of response. Several weeks in, she begins throwing toys at me from the corner of the room, which I gently toss back to her. After a few weeks of this, though, she pulls out two small whiteboards and initiates communication through writing. When I write in response, she looks at it or not, or grabs my board and erases what I've written. When she does on occasion respond, it is most often with pure sarcasm. Um, it takes many more weeks before I'm allowed to direct oral speech toward her. With decreasing frequency, she demands that I turn the chair around and act like I'm not there. Sometimes I can tell what has prompted the demand, other times I can't. When after many weeks, Lauren allows us to play, it consists of things that have no obvious secret content, no disguised symbolic meaning, not at least as I had initially thought of it. We have long stretches of side-by-side -side painting. We dance and chant nonsense songs, play catch and jump rope and count. She sets up elaborate arrangements of the small plastic animals I keep in the bucket, but does not speak about what she's doing. I rarely address the issues that cause Child Protective Services who hold custody of Lauren to order her into therapy. And yet things happen in our, in our sessions, although it is very hard for me to say what they are, let alone report them to my supervisor or in the computerized treatment notes required by Medicaid. My supervision and study as a therapist is in contemporary relational psychoanalysis. It is a school of psychoanalytic research and practice that, that engages dynamic systems theories, infant research, and a postmodern take on developmental psychology that posits humans as fundamentally relational, emergent, dynamic, transpersonal systems that construct and revise internal models of the interpersonal world from ongoing experiences. Beginning in infancy, humans are understood as engaged in learning patterns of anticipating and responding to affective energy as it flows through relationships with people, events, and things. Humans are understood as constantly affecting and being affected, most often at the level of the procedural unconscious, that part of the mind that processes mechanical, semantic, and structural information and generates and stores and revises predictive schema in non-symbolized form out of the awareness of the involved parties. The procedural unconscious is our schema of how we know, how, of, of how we interact with other people, things, environments, and events without having to think about it. It is what we just know to do. Philip Bromberg, in describing the relationship between the mind and experience, provides a description of the flexible context-specific organization of the procedural unconscious. He describes the mind as organized by multiple shifting self states that are responsive to the relational demand of the given context. Speaking of human interactions, he says, each partner through his or her own way of being with the other is effectively, excuse me, is affectively reacting to parts of what is taking place between them that lack symbolic representation as an interpersonal event. Donald Stern, in his infant research, demonstrates that without language or conscious awareness from infancy, we dismiss, condense, and focus elements of the actions of others to achieve a gestalt of movement, force, time, space, and intention or directionality. Intention does not have to be understood as the conscious intention of the other to do something, but rather the force and momentum of a given action a prediction of the light, likely outcome of movement, force, and time. Thus, when an infant is presented with an image of a car driving across the screen and disappearing behind a wall, 
By about three months, the infants will gaze at the other side of the wall in anticipation of the car's reemergence. And by about five months, the infant can anticipate velocity. These neural assembly thus, assemblies thus function in a predictive way, allowing the viewer to anticipate moves and relevant responses in the ongoing exchanges. From birth then, we, we participate in dyadic regulatory systems engaged in constant unconscious micro exchanges of information. In both my research and my clinical practice, I borrow from Deleuze and Guattari to conceptualize therapy as an emergent assemblage taking place in the present, in the room, with the specificity of the client and the therapist involved in movements among past, present, and future. The play and the words brought into the session by my client and by me are artifacts of our relational experiences and products of how we each enact these experiences. In engaging across our differences to produce something new in the sessions, we are living life in the ongoing present, forming relations and connections across signs, objects, and bodies in often unexpected ways. Such activity is created and fed by the ongoing flow of affective intensities that are different from the rational control of meanings and forms. As the Boston Chain Study Group, Boston Chain Process Study Group writes, Therapy can be conceptualized as a complicated dance in which clients work consciously, but to an even greater extent unconsciously to predict and direct the nature of the engagement through regulating and controlling physical, psychical, and emotional distance, moving toward and away from one another, or to avoid something happening, or to get something to happen, or to increase or decrease the state of arousal, or to shift the affective state in relation to the other. At the heart of the therapy is how the therapist responds to these relational moves, how successfully or unsuccessfully we, successfully we co-create the feeling of being in sync with one another, whether we come to feel fitted or if we are left with the feeling of that the other is a million miles away. A central therapeutic concern is with relational schema that have hardened into repetitive or territorialized responses that are alert to danger, but not to context that are not flexible and that have little room for creativity, experimentation, and improvisation. Many of my clients have experienced long-term or persistent trauma that in the service of self-defense have prompted the development of relational schema that constantly capture and organize potentialities into knowable versions of the same. In other words, the children keep enacting the same relational schema regardless of the context. It is understandable, brilliant even, that based on their prior experiences, they enact schema which have given them some ability to predict what might happen or has given them some sense of control in their out of control situations. The problem is when enacted in other contexts, their defenses not only at land them in trouble, but they also rob them of sources of help, connection and joy. The goal of therapy is to provide a relationship that in being different, being persistently different from the schema the children bring with them, expands their repertoire of what is possible. To borrow again from Deleuze and Guattari, if we understand relational patterns as forms of territorialization of events and relationships into already known patterns of meaning making, then relational psychoanalysis works toward deterritorializations and re-territorializations that facilitate a capacity for movement, for a welcoming of emergence, creativity, flexibility, and, the po and possibilities for both my client and I that did not exist for either of us prior to our relationship. It matters a great deal that both the child and I are, engaged, are changed in the therapy. We affect one another. That we do that is for both the child and I, a profound experience of mattering. Although I do not have a lot of time, to, although I do not have time to say a lot about it, I think it will be interesting for this group that in this 2010 book, Forms of Vitality, Exploring Dynamic Experience in Psychology and the Arts, Daniel Stern draws primarily from the arts, including dance, music, theater, and cinema, to illustrate what the feeling of being fitted, the experience of affective attunement, not requiring speech or symbolic representation, looks like. He demonstrates that affective attunement is polymodal, 
He uses the ex example of a baby who successfully grasps a toy and squeals with pleasure and the mother dancing in response. What matters according to Stern is not that the response uh, matches in form, a squeal to a squeal or a dance to a dance, but rather that it matches in affective tone and intensity. Stern describes how humans work across modalities through things such as pitch, duration, volume, direction, and other non-speech forms to communicate attunement in ways that are taken in and responded to without speech or conscious awareness. The result of experiences of affective attunement is the experience of efficacy, of being able to affect the world and being affected by it, of having material reality, which translates into engagement and a sense of vitality, which I argue elsewhere are central to learning. And now back to Lauren. I have been staring at the wall for 15 minutes, trying to get, catch glam, glimpses of what Lauren is doing when I think she isn't looking at me, getting yelled at when she catches me. She knows I am watching her as best I can. And now three years into the treatment, she's no longer serious about me not looking at her. Although at times she needs to assert this control, but now she has an impulse to engage me and she blurts out a song. You're an elephant's ass. You like to eat trash and everybody hates, 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 hates you. I turn to look at her and smile. She appears to get angry at the smile. She repeats the song, putting emphasis on the hate part. Everybody hates, 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 hates you. But it feels to me more like a performance of anger than the real thing. Like these days, her heart just isn't into the hatred. I repeat the song to her with appropriate variations. I'm an elephant's ass. I like to eat trash. And everybody hates, 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 hates me. She smiles in spite of herself and returns to her dollhouse play. But this time, she does not demand that I turn away. So it goes with Lauren. I have become deeply interested in the fact that the children initiate sound games like this with me all the time. We chant the al alphabet while performing improvised dance moves or producing hand percussion music, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. The children make up lyrics, lyrics and chants, which they repeat over and over again, playing with changing the tone, pitch, intensity, and speed. Evan crashed Gail's car and Gail yelled, oh no. Evan crashed Gail's car and Gail yelled, oh no. Evan crashed Gail's car and Gail yelled, oh no. What is this about? Drawing from Adrian Harris, I think of these as deeply rhythmic and resonant ways of being together. Fast and slow, near and far, loud and quiet, hard and soft, chanted, sung and shouted, these qualities all matter. They are all material. They are physical vibrating experiences, raw sensory elements that work through resonance or prosody as sounds become the material through which we explore a physically registered mutual attunement, which we might call the ability to play or dance together. Eka leka leka loo, chants Marley. Oka loka loka moo, I respond. I have come to think of this sound play, which is a, such a frequent part of our sessions, as the micro level of physically registered attunement, much, where much of the relating and possibility lie. As the psychoanalyst Adam Bloom writes of connections he makes with his adolescent patients through music, musical phenomena form an unarticulated substrate of experience, primarily rhythm and harmony, which can establish conditions in which two people might have a kind of non-spoken conversation, a non-symbolic medium of emotional exchange, as well as a binding element of inchoate experience that can be lived together without cohering into spoken words. What happens in this non-symbolized sound space in the clinic has to do, I now believe, with what is communicated about relational possibilities possibilities of leading and following, coming close and moving away, coming into tune and dropping into dissonance. These changes direct, directly address relational schema or repertoires without ever being talked about or even consciously marked. 
Can I affect this space or event, or am I at its mercy? Who can we be to one another in this mix? What, is, what can the materials and time and space we share be or do or help us to become? What things are now possible? Bloom addresses the rhythmic musicality of the therapy session, the power of rhythm and predictability and improvisation. He addresses the sharing of these rhythmic exchanges as a non-symbolic description of the process by which increasingly nuanced and complex aspects of experience develop between physical bodies in relation to one another. It is essential that my clients feel the ability to regulate the emotional demands or requests I make, demands for closeness and distance, openness, openness or closedness, being alone or being with others. Bloom argues that the building up of rhythmic predictability over time shared together creates the predictable feel for this kind of exchange, the client opening, the therapist response, the client response, and so on, creates a fundamental sense of rhythm that helps form the sensory floor of therapeutic interactions. Bloom says, I believe that the main function of this way of talking in our treatment is not to discover things about ourselves or one another, nor to communicate primitive needs or provisions, but rather to begin to feel the particular quality of qualities of what it feels like for the two of us to relate to one another, a kind of experienced but not verbalized experience of melody and rhythm, allowing for enhanced moment to moment tracking of shifts in the relational field. Bloom goes on reporting on an adolescent client whose sessions were almost entirely taken up with listening to music whose content he often found to be violent and disturbing. The most important aspect of our work is not the admittedly disconcerting content of the material, but rather the patient's newly apparent willingness to impact at a physical level, the increasingly containing structure of our treatment. The durability of this physical container once in place creates a powerful, or excuse me, creates a potential for still unknown untested elements of experience to emerge. Lauren sings to me, you're an elephant's ass, you like to eat trash, and everybody hates, 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 hates you. She makes it clear to me that I do not matter to her in that moment, and indeed, right then, nobody matters to her except her parents, who she cannot have. She has no friends at school. She says she doesn't care about anyone. She drives people away. She screams at me, you're too close, move over there. Stand in that corner, don't come near me. I obey, but as the months and years pass, I begin rolling my eyes or whistling or humming a little tune. We both know by now that this is not necessary is my implicit message. She wants to be back with her parents. Lauren's parents come out of incarceration and pretty much every time she sees them, something awful happens. They hurt her, they don't show up. They pick her up and drop her off at the house of a stranger while they go out partying. They bring her a present and then with a big flourish, take it away and give it to someone else. I don't know this from Lauren, but I hear it from her foster family. I say to Lauren, hey, I, I hear you saw your mom. She says, yeah, it was great. We go back to our play, playing, we sing count and then Lauren tricks me with made up numbers. She practices cheerleading routine she's made up and I applaud. Sometimes she smiles a little. Sometimes she catches herself smiling and tells me to shut up. She makes up more lyrics to her Everyone Hates Gail song, and I receive them with enthusiasm. Over time, the song changes in quality. It becomes a game we share. When the lyrics get too repetitive, I say, oh, come on, you can do better than that. You say stupid too much. How about idiotic? How about Gail's an idiot? We know it's true. And she really, 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 really smells like dog poo. We can both laugh now at the same time as long as I don't comment on it. And then other things start happening. She begins to venture statements about her parents. I hate it when they do that. I'm very careful in response. I know you do, you love them. One day she says, when I act like that, I'm being just like, excuse me, just like my parents. Um, and I tell her, and I say to her, tell me more about that. And then one day she comes into the clinic late, red eyed and very upset. Her foster parents tell me she has gotten into trouble at school. I ask her what's happened and she says, 
they gave me an attention and I told them I have an appointment. I can't miss it. They didn't care. I started crying and yelling at them. I was so afraid I wouldn't get to see you. These kinds of words are few. They don't happen very often, but they are significant. In other words, I'm not saying that words don't matter. In fact, I think it's very important that Lauren got to a place where she understood something about how and why she acted as she did. And she could say it and admit in a sideways way that our relationship matters. And she could seek comfort from me. Words and the ability to think about things matter, but other things pave the road that got us to these words. And also, it's important to be clear that the words do not replace the other stuff or become the things that matter the most. Oh, I'm on the wrong slide. Uh, okay. Um, for the last months we worked together, most of our sessions are taken up with painting. I admire her paintings. I have the feeling of a younger child who is saying, watch me, and who needs my admiration and positive regard, and things I am happy to give her, because I genuinely love this now young adolescent. She tells me what to paint, and I'm embarrassed. I am definitely no painter, but I know it's important, and I do it. She shows me what to do. I do it badly. She claps and tells me, that's really great, Gail, a 10. I know that's not true. But these are the expressions of a girl who's beginning to have friends and get invited to parties, whose teachers now say she's doing well, who's recognizing that her parents' way of being aren't what she wants for herself, and who's beginning to imagine that she can love and be loved in return. So now I'm gonna transition to the second story, which is shorter, um, which I'm calling Bo and the Weight of Sand. I saw a child I've given a pseudonym Bo for therapy from the ages of nine to 11. I'm going to pick up the story at a point about a year into my seeing him when I've just come back from a two week vacation to the news that while I'm out, Bo was subjected to several incidents of serious abuse. It is the first session after my return and Bo is manic. He cannot stay in the room. He runs up and down the halls. He cannot stop, cannot speak to me. The next week he comes in and sits in front of the sand table and begins moving sand around saying nothing. He fills containers, empties them, moves sand from side to side of the table, uh, from one side of the table to the other. I watch, attempting to offer commentary that he seems to not hear. I talk about fear, anger, betrayal, bow moves sand. I feel like a failure for not protecting him and for not being able to reach him. This continues, me talking and talking and him mutely shoveling and shoveling for weeks. But then there's a session where he's once again moving sand into the buck in and out of buckets but something different happens. He looks up and seems to notice me. He looks at me for several seconds and then without a word, he reaches under the table, fishes out another shovel and bucket, hands them to me and goes back to shoveling. I begin to dig. For a few moments, I barely notice what I'm doing. I'm preoccupied with the same anxious questions about how to help him that have characterized our sessions for weeks. But then I become aware of myself shoveling. I become interested in shoveling. The shoveling begins to take over my consciousness, settling my frazzled mind. I begin to notice the weight of the sand, the heft of the bucket. I begin to watch the sand filling the shovel and flowing into the bucket. I feel the rhythm of my repeated movements and my breathing slows and matches it. Without thinking about it, I change the angle of the shovel, watching the sand fall, now faster, now slower. I watch how it piles up, now smooth, now striated. I watch individual grains land, fall, land, get lost. I am lost. Time and worry and thought melt away. I'm free. For the next several weeks, I shovel sand with Bo. In fact, I look forward to shoveling sand with him. Now I am again slowly filling the bucket when I become aware of Bo's voice trying to pull me back. Gail, Gail! Even as I know I have to pull my eyes from the sand, I can feel the reluctance in every part of my body. I don't want to leave the sand. I don't want to hear or to feel what Bo has to say. I put the shovel down and look at him. He begins to cry and says, why did she do that? There's a lot I can say about this scene, but what I wanna focus on is the materiality of the non-speaking. There are some qualities to sand in this assemblage. It's density, it's viscosity, it's textures, the way it moves that can, if allowed, change time, 
deterritorialize, becoming sand. When I accepted Bo's invitation and invested myself in sand shoveling, I became newly capable of, ex of um, becoming with not having to think and not having to answer a demand. I was affecting Bo and he was affecting me and we were both being deeply affected, not only by the magnificent qualities of sand, but also how sand and our movements moved together and apart with respect, um, yeah, moved apart with respect to the sand and also we, with respect to one another, how our temple moved together and apart, how our mood joined and broke apart, our intensity, our direction, our, mo our momentum. We worked with absolutely no speech, side by side, close but not touching, shovels sometimes bumping as we reached for the same sand. I would find myself love, lo, running low on sand and he would spontaneously pour some out of his bucket and replenish my supply. I would realize that he had stopped shoveling and was staring at a pile and I stopped and looked too. We were both mesmerized by a pile he built over time, higher and higher, watching the dry sand flow into in tiny streams to mound, peak, topple. We were deeply interacting without spoken language, without goal-directed thought and without consciousness of what was happening. We were not exactly lost in the sand as I earlier suggested. Rather, we were moving between being lost and being found. There was a great deal that happened, a shared experience of attunement and reciprocity, a joining with sand and with one another, registered tacitly in the body, which created affective movement and eventually Bo found a need to speak. Speaking then joined with the things we had already created and were creating and would create. Again, I am not arguing that language does not matter. I'm saying that words function as tools and that they can be used to affect the client or the therapist by conveying information about where they stand in relation to one another and what new or unexpected ways of relating and being are possible. Words are important. What I'm saying is that words are material in the same sense that sand and buckets and sound are material, not greater, not lesser, but things that carry territorializing and deterritorializing potential. Jessica Benjamin conceptualizes a successful analytic relationship as resulting in a client who learns to trust an object world as a series of opportunities for self-articulation and can trust also that as she becomes more and more herself, as her idiom finds its way to expression, she does not need to hold on to specific identifications and past defensive self states that did not serve her well. For the children I work with, this achievement of different or more varied and flexible self articulations is rarely marked through self reflexive proclamations, but rather is demonstrated through new possibilities and new determinations in their play and in how they relate to me, the playroom, its materials, and her life in the world outside the clinic. So because I need to conclude now, I will just say this. I don't know about art educators, but a lot of the rest of us educators often have very poor or incomplete theories about what matters in classrooms. At the very least, the things that fuel what we typically think about as learning are often not happening at the level of representation and have little to do with curriculum. What now interests me most is the stuff that never rises to the level of meaning or consciousness or participates in symbolization or representation and how we can think of those things as mattering. There is so much more I would love to say and think with you now in our discussion regarding the things that happen in classrooms that may or may not use speech but that are not about speech and how they are at the heart of learning. So that's it. <laughs>